journey to the South Downs National Park will look at the early history of preservation and conservation movements in the United Kingdom and the movement towards the creation of national parks after World War II. And we'll further consider why the South Downs National Park was so late in being created when it had been proposed at a much earlier date. We have to consider 19th century Britain. It was a rapidly urbanising nation. By 1851, the census returns show that as many people lived in urban districts as lived in rural districts. And by 1871, the trend to urbanisation was definitely in place. This makes the United Kingdom the world's first urban nation. In 2008, the United Nations declared the world was urban in that more people lived in cities and towns and general urban areas than lived in rural locations. In the 19th century, the cities were insanitary, overcrowded, pollution, both in water, food supplies and air pollution from mass industry, uh, not just in the recognised industrial locations around Manchester or Sheffield or, or um, the South Wales coalfield, but in big areas, particularly in London. Living conditions were appalling. Uh, and people who could get away, which were a very limited number of people with leisure time and money for transport, could do so. As a century wore on, improvements in mass transport, horse buses in London from the 1820s enabled people with access to the fare for the horse bus to get to the edge of the urban area to enjoy um, such rural delights as could be found, places like Islington or Hackney. Uh, or Hammersmith. And then the introduction of railways again needed access to the, the fare for the, for the journey that allowed people to get further away still. But we're really talking about a limited number of people. After the 1871 Act, which allowed people to have bank holidays as time off, there was more access to rural areas. And indeed, as wage levels rose, so more people could uh, get away from the urban areas. Urban areas were seen as places of civilization. Rural areas were often seen as places diametrically opposite to that. In the early 18th century, Daniel Defoe, passing through the Lake District, Noted here, not were these hills high and formidable only, but they had a kind of unhospitable terror in them, but all barren and wild, of no use or advantage either to man or beast. That was the general view of wild places, heathland, forested areas, the sea indeed, and certainly places like the Welsh mountains, the Pennines, or here, the Lake District. Travellers could not wait to get through these areas. There was no perception that they were beautiful. This, of course, would change in the 19th century. This in Wordsworth's poem, where he actually is extolling the virtues here of uh, the wilder landscapes uh, in the north and the west of the country. The other side of this slide shows you a more local view to Sussex, and this is Bramber Castle in the 1780s uh, being sketched by a couple of gentlemen. And by the end of the 18th century, uh, when the Enlightenment meant more people were interested in science, such things as geology, which then would have been called natural science, in natural history, and you have people such as Gilbert White at Selborne recording natural history events in his diary and there were general classification of plants, birds and animals and there was more understanding of the wild spaces and the open spaces and that can be seen here where uh, an ancient building is being sketched. Viewpoints become important in the 19th century Guides to Brighton extol the virtues of taking a carriage 
to the Devil's Dyke, for instance, um, to look at the view. And in this view of the 1820s, not too dissimilar to the view up there today. Lots of people, carriages driving over the downland, people are playing, um, looks like people dancing on the right hand side. There's a tavern in the background. Um, you know, general view of people having a good time and a few people looking at the distant view uh, across the Weald uh, and over along the line of the Downs. So more and more attention was given to the view of nature. The introduction of the railways in the country from the 1830s onwards means that there is access to remote spots and it's no longer many days journey, particularly from London, to wilder spots of the kingdom. Railways allow access to uh, very, very uh, remote locations, uh, indeed, as far away as you can get from London uh, to the very north of Scotland. Of course, railways were not very cheap in the 19th century. They did become cheaper and more people were able to use them. But in the early period, again, it was limited to those people with leisure time and cash to access the transport. Some communities benefited from this. Uh, Bramber in the late 19th century um, had a tea garden industry. And there's two adverts here, one from the 1950s uh, and one from the 1920s uh, for Bramber. And this was a nice side issue with a decline in UK agriculture, particularly in the southeast of England. Communities had to find new ways of raising funds. And when the railway line from Shoreham up through uh, Bramber, Stenning and on to Horsham opened, it gave access to particularly beautiful pieces of landscape, the Ada Valley, the north side of the Downs, out into the low and high Weald. Agriculture in the 19th century was suffering badly. In Sussex in particular, we produced a lot of grain, see in the top watercolour here from the 1930s, and we produced a lot of sheep, South Down sheep in particular, to our native county breed. The problem was that other places produced the same things but in greater and cheaper quantities. And in the United States and Canada, the prairie lands were opened up to arable farming. And in Australia and New Zealand, huge numbers of sheep were kept. Not a problem until the 1880s when freezer ships are invented, which means you can move frozen carcasses literally from the other side of the world. And it was actually cheaper to keep sheep in New Zealand and carry them across the world to the UK than to keep them in Sussex and drive them overland up to London. So the things that we produced, particularly in the southeast, uh, were not required. Rents could not be paid. Landowners dropped rentals to farmers and landed occupiers. And there was a general malaise in the agricultural industry. As such, by the end of the 19th century, many areas which had been sheep grazing uh, had lost their covering. This is a 19th century watercolour here of the Devil's Dyke looking across towards New Timber Hill, not far from the, the centre of Brighton. And conspicuous here that there are no sheep on what would have been uh, sheep downland. A consequence of which the land values dropped and proposals were made to develop the land. The left hand side you can see a, a newspaper article here from a local Brighton newspaper uh, for Mrs Barrisford, who was a very wealthy lady. She had owned the Hippodrome Music Hall in Middle Street and she had a proposal here to uh, erect a small town on the 240 acres of the Dyke estate. Um, that caused concern. Uh, it didn't happen. And in 1926, when the Saddlescombe farm adjacent to that um, was sold, it was purchased with the express intention of stopping it being developed for speculative housing. And the person who did that great deed was Herbert Carden, an old Brighton family, mayor and freeman of Brighton, who went to the auction purchased the estate and then sold it back to Brighton for the price he paid for it so that it could not be used as a bungalow community or bungalow town as they were termed at the time. By the early years of the 20th century more and more people were accessing rural areas, some quite near 
to the urban areas with the express intention of just going for a walk. And a whole series of books appear. Uh, there's but two of them here. Newspapers such as the Evening News on a Friday would carry um, a column advertising or depicting a walk you could take. The intention was that you would cut these out, paste them to a piece of cardboard, put it in your pocket, and you could take a ramble around the edge of the urban area. Whether it was Manchester, which was a very early um, proponent of these newspaper walking tours, or indeed here tramping around London. The bus companies and the undergrounds in London and the railway companies thought this was a great idea, could increase their revenues at the weekend when they weren't heavily used by commuters or people going to work. And so you've got a 1915 um, here poster for uh, London motor buses. There was more access to ways of negotiating the countryside, uh, ordnance survey maps. You see here the price of them, two and six, 12 and a half pence, which was a huge sum of money uh, to buy it for a leisure purposes map. And you'll notice from the image here, this is not Chichester and Worthing, it was a generic picture on the cover, but more and more people would acquire ordnance survey maps and allow them to follow footpaths and bridleways. London Transport in particular uh, was a in the forefront of promoting these and giving more and more people access. And this is from 1936, um, London Transport Country Walks. And these appear quite regularly uh, with little descriptions of the walks and the illustrations here by a very famous interwar artist, Eric Revillius, who grew up in Eastbourne and did many of his illustrative work on the Sussex countryside. The most dramatic confrontation between people providing services in the rural areas and the new leisure seekers was on the Pennine range where the big conurbations surrounding the southern area of the Pennines, Manchester, West Yorkshire, Sheffield and Nottingham Derby, um, people were attempting to go out on what were grouse moors, uh, specific areas kept for uh, game shooting. Um, confrontations between gamekeepers and walkers became more and more frequent and in 1932, the occasion of the mass trespass took place where an organised body of hundreds of walkers, uh, led by many socialist politicians, um, went on to the moors above Manchester. And there was a violent confrontation between them, the police and the gamekeepers. But it got it into the, lo into the local and certainly the national press. And at that time, the very important newsreels, the days before television, people would go to the cinema twice a week. As part of the film programme, you saw a news reel that showed you what was happening and people across the country uh, would see this. And it led to a general upwelling of opinion that access to the countryside was good and people stopping you getting on there uh, by force uh, was not good. There were cartoons that say similar. This is from 1936 in Punch, a satirical magazine. And you can see here two walkers fighting their way across a traffic jam by walking along the top of the bus. And in the distance there, a background, you have trespassers will be prosecuted and a fence separating you from the trees and presumably the countryside. Sing hey for the open road. And so an ironical air to that. Cheaper ways getting into the countryside rather than taking the bus or the train, uh, you could take a bicycle ride. And after the 1880s, when safety bicycles, as they were termed then, became popular, um, cycling uh, rose rapidly in popularity. This is an interwar picture taken over at Shoreham sometime in the 1930s, uh, showing a cycling band going out. Of course, you'd go much further than if you were walking, uh, and it allowed um, trips out to beauty spots and often it's the first occasion where young people could get away uh, without older people being with them so you know they could go away unchaperoned as it was done not just the bus companies which promoted this um, the railway companies in particular southern railway published a whole series of posters and see the one on the left here for you know, our south downs on the right hand side a series of booklets um, S.P.B. Mace was a famous broadcaster and travel writer who lived at Southwick Manor House near Shoreham. He was a prolific writer and these were produced of what we would call today flexi covers. So they could get wet if you're out in the countryside with a bit too much damage uh, and they were just big enough to go into your, your coat pocket 
and the dis walks descriptions in there uh, took you on a circular walk or from one railway station to another railway station. As people went out in the countryside, particularly in the 30s, 20s and particularly so in the 30s, they realised just how much was going under housing very close to towns. This is one example on the edge of Brighton at Patcham on the west side of the main London road, which is now the A23, the Sweet Hill Estate. This land had been sold in 1921 by the Marquis of Abergenny, and it was snapped up by a local speculator, split up into 208 what were termed plot lands, and people self-built bungalows, old army huts mostly, shacks and shanties, and on a big open bare hillside, it was considered a complete eyesore next to the main road. More importantly, this was near, as you'll see at the bottom of the picture, the patch and pumping station and the reservoirs for Brighton. And eventually this was all cleared under a compulsory purchase order as being dangerous for the water supply. But this was bubbling up right the way across Britain and it caused much concern. This was a more orderly housing estate. This was in, again in Patcham in 1934, about 10 years after that previous map. Uh, to the north of Patcham, this is the Ladies Mile Estate uh, being built by a major house builder, George Ferguson. But you can see the amount of land being used there, the ribbon development going out along some of the highways and marching out into the, into the downland. As such, in that interwar period, there was an upsurge in the interest of what was called preservation. These days, I think we would probably say conservation. But this was the major attempt here to do a development at Crowlink Farm on the world famous today, Seven Sisters. And you can see by the Seven Sisters Preservation Fund, the people involved in it, an awful lot of people with titles or letters before and after their name, including Ramsay MacDonald, who had been prime minister, a bishop, an earl, various lords and and many, many MPs and some, some uh, famous writers, John Galsworthy there and E.V. Lucas and Arthur Beckett. So um, a lot of public concern. Um, it was saved, thankfully. The, the attempt to develop that area to what would have been um, a close cousin of Peacehaven was stopped. Um, there's a plaque here up on the downs on a on a big stone, I'm afraid, rather um, stained here by uh, seagull droppings, uh, but the Society of Sussex Downsmen appreciating the generosity of William Charles Campbell, who came up with a large sum of money. And this was largely see Arthur Beckett's name at the bottom on the left hand side. He was an Eastbourne businessman and one of the people who set up the Society of Sussex Downsmen. On the right hand side, uh, that uh, portrait is of Viscount Gage, the sixth Viscount Gage, who was uh, chairman of. East Sussex County Council, and it's in this sales and time presented by Viscount Cage of Phil, and he was a, a, a great proponent of keeping the countryside as green as it could be. Exactly the same time, uh, the, the, uh, the Preservation of Rural England booklet, the Campaign for the Preservation of Rural England, uh, was created. Um, some well meaning people came together uh, to alleviate some of the pressures on the countryside by rampant development, planning controls were quite lax. Images such as this were widely portrayed and here you've got uh, St George uh, fighting the dragon of development here with all the tin signs and the industry and the litter uh, against the, you know, the countryside and the families and the children on the right hand side. Influential book here Clough Williams Ellis was an architectural writer and an architect, very wealthy Welsh landowner. Some of you may know him as a creator of Port Mirian, the Italian village in northwest Wales. And England and the Octopus came out in 1928, and here's the octopus of development gobbling up the manor house and the cottage, the church and the woodland and the village green. This is still a very hard hitting book. Um, nearly 100 years later, you could read that, and it's still very, very um, pertinent with us today. B. Mace again brought out this book, Hills of the South, um, in 1939. Um, unfortunately, just war was about to break out, but there was still this great upwelling of, of 
affection for particularly the landscape of southern Britain, uh, the landscape which was being threatened south of London and around Brighton and Eastbourne and Worthing by the big housing corporations. And there's some wonderful illustrative material in here. Images such as this is warning. This is Lower, Lower Barpham uh, by Audrey Weber, one of the illustrators for this book, wonderful sky and a very evocative landscape here. And this is what people were seeking to preserve. And of course, this is how the landscape around the edges of Worthing and Brighton and Eastbourne would have looked like before suburban development. Most of the, of the suburbs of those uh, resorts have their origins in uh, farmsteads such as this. Mace himself was a great proponent of walking as well as writing books. He took guided tours out and this is one he took in 1932 where you get a train from Victoria Station at 10 past midnight, arrive in Stenning in West Sussex um, at a quarter to two uh, and take a walk up to Chanterbury Ring and then get the train back at 7.20. Um, there are reports that on one occasion he took 1,000 people for a walk. Now I do guided walks and I have taken um, 92 people out on a walk once, which is not an easy thing to do, but to take a thousand people out on a walk was something. The threat for housing is very real. Um, these are the figures for Great Britain between the First World War and the Second World War with this relentless growth in housing. And in fact, if you look at the figure there for 1936, um, a huge number we have never since that date top that figure for house building. So vast areas were going under um, concrete and bricks and mortar. The map of Brighton here from 1940, and you can see looking along the Lewis Road here on the western side, you've got an estate developing at Hollingdean. Up on the northwest corner, the far edges of Patcham, pushing out into the downland valleys and the Celtic field system. Along the Lewis Road, the developments at the bottom of the map are what is sometimes called the Boer War Estate from early in the 20th century. Then Molescombe, the garden suburb, North Molescombe, the development at Coldine. And these great tentacles of development, remember the Octopus uh, England and the Octopus book. And people were concerned that Areas which they had known as green spaces, leisure spaces, were being gobbled up, not just by mass housing, but by inappropriately located housing. And 10 years after England and the Octopus comes out Britain and the Beast. And this was edited by Clough Williams Ellis, but contained a vast number of influential writers. And Maynard Keynes at the top there, uh, the economist Ian Forster, the novelist, um, A.G. Street, he was a famous farmer, naturalist such as R.M. Lockley, S.P.B. Mace himself, the writer is in there. And this was a very influential book, but it's coming just before the war. And so what it's proposing had to be put on hold. But this is a general welling up of um, affirmation that something had to be done. And then comes the war. And one of the most potent images in the war was of this downland scene. And this is looking across to the Burling Sheep Centre, uh, looking up to Beltoot Lighthouse, the channel in the distance, and you're right there in the heart of the South Downs. It's actually a manufactured picture in that the background view is of that location on the South Downs. The foreground with the shepherd and his dogs and the sheep um, was actually from a photograph of a hillside near Ringma uh, on the northeast of Lewis and the two pictures were put together and this potent symbol of Englishness was, was created. And it was highly influential. This is it, this is your Britain fight for it now. Okay. And during the war, there was this notion that we're winning the war by working together. We are going to defeat fascism, going to be a better future and we can't go back to the past where anyone could buy a piece of land and stick a house on it, whether it was on the top of Devil's Dyke or whether it was on a cliff top um, over the English Channel. And so 1943, in the middle of the war, saving the South Downs. The pictures here around Washington in West Sussex. End of the war, 1945, 
This book comes out on planning, rural planning to preserve the more open and spectacular regions of the countryside for the recreation of the congested town populations. And it says, look, to search for physical adventure amongst the hills of the Lake District or Wales or the wild scenery of the southwest. Intriguingly, the southeast doesn't feature in that description. Immediately after the war, people wanted to get out. The war was over. Um, there was still great privations, still a lot of food rationing, petrol rationing. You couldn't go very far, but you could go for walks in the countryside. And these little booklets come out. They're tiny booklets with paperback booklets, but with a paper cover that was a map that went not very practical as maps, but a whole raft of these come out on very cheap austerity uh, paper but very enjoyable, there's a few photos in them, little maps and drawings. Um, people could get out and about for the first time for many, many years. And in particular, the area around Brighton, uh, which the, the, the bottom right hand uh, booklet, which is heavily used by the military for training purposes. So big areas of the down still had unexploded shells and mortar bombs and grenades on them. Indeed, they're still finding them even this period in the 21st century. But People wanted to get out into this, these areas. And throughout the war, and particularly towards the end of the war, there was this huge idea that we've got to have a better society. And you get the creation of the National Health Service. You get the nationalisation of major industries and the railways. Um, there's the new concept of the Butler Education Act. that Education would be in more um, cohesive and access to the countryside came as part of that Town and Country Planning Act, very important, 1947. So there's a whole series of these legislative measures. Well, some great books came out. Now, who would bring out a book with a title such as this today? The Untutored Townsman's Invasion of the Country. Professor Joad was a famous broadcaster on the BBC. He lived at Stedham in West Sussex, uh, along the Western Rother Valley near to Midhurst. A uh, very influential writer and speaker. Um, and uh, this is a book, uncompromising title here. Okay. National parks became a talking point. They were not new. The first national park that really had that title was in 1872, way out in the wild west of America at Yellowstone. Um, by the First World War, there were other um, national parks established in relatively unlikely places. South Africa had a national park. What was then the Belgian Congo had one in 1913. But it's a long time coming into the United Kingdom. And it comes with the National Parks and Access to the Countryside Act of 1949. And there you've got the first 10 national parks are designated. And here's a list of them. And of course, they're in the very beautiful but wild places such as Snowdonia, Dartmoor or the North York Moors. Um, Sussex and the South Downs is not on that list. It had been on the proposal in 1949. There were 12 national parks. 11th was the North Cornwall Coast. That was thrown out because it would have been in blocks along the coast and you had to have a contiguous boundary to a national park. So that was thrown out. And also the South Downs. Why would anyone not want to include the South Downs? 50 or less than 50 miles from the world's biggest city. Why wouldn't you want that included? Well, these were the reasons given. Between the wars, there had been indiscriminate housing development. And you can see in the top left hand side there, a 1920s view of Peacehaven, vast amount of space given over to very, very few properties. During the war, the military and you see in the bottom left hand picture, here, the road going up above the downs uh, from Worthing over to Stenning. Um, huge number of tanks there. A the military had used lots of the South Downs for training purposes. Many of the roads which we now use, such as the Ditching Road going out to Brighton, uh, were really flinty tracks before the war and had been metalled um, to create easy access for the military. And the third reason they said not to include the National Park, in the South Downs in the National Park, was agriculture. During the war, we had to plough up huge areas uh, to feed the nation, the plough up campaign. 
And this is an image of a lady driving a tractor in the fields behind Rotting Dean in 1943. And this is between speculative builders, the military and agriculture. There was nothing left on the South Downs worth preserving. And so it was thrown out of the original 12. There were still concerns by the 1950s. This is in the Times and it's the Sussex Downs designation proposals made. And it shows you the article about uh, the uh, boundaries to protect landscape beauty brings some surprises. And there's the boundary at the top of the 1959 proposals. And below it is the boundary of the current National Park as it was designated in 2011. Remarkably similar. It took a long, long time to get that park into creation. Most of the contention being the West Sussex portion, what was called the Western Wheel. You can see that the South Downs National Park is not just the area of the chalk downland. It includes the green sand heaths and the wheeled clay areas of West Sussex, rather more in the National Park as it became than in the 1959 proposals. And also the National Park currently extends westwards to Winchester, uh, which proposals weren't there at the earlier day. And so present day National Park has a range of scenery, not just chalk grassland. It extends from the borders of Winchester, right on the western border of the um, of the park here, looking over that uh, lovely city, down through the very um, lush area of the Meehan Valley in the eastern part of Hampshire, the River Meehan running through that, over into Selborne, which is the, the home of the Reverend Gilbert White, which in the 18th century, one of the early uh, recording naturalists, and then the, Su the Sussex heathlands around Midhurst, and this is looking northwestwards um, across a largely um, uninhabited landscape, as it would look here. The few houses in the mid distance, but making Sussex look incredibly wild and uninhabited. Uh, through the wetlands of the Pulborough Wild Brooks, and then onto the eastern Sussex Downs, the, the more familiar concept of the Downs as being open sheep grassland. And finally, ending up one of the most famous sites indeed in the world of the Seven Sisters Cliffs, the seaward end of the National Park. National parks are a very important part of the landscape and the designated proposals to include more of them. Um, since the 1951 proposals, uh, you had the, the Norfolk Broads added, uh, the New Forest, latterly the South Downs, and proposals now for even more. Chilterns is up for proposals to the northwest of London. And some of the economic reasons here for, for indeed keeping in with the National and it, it does work. This is the view from my house up in Hollingbury on the hill above Brighton, looking out towards the Chattery across the urban edge of Brighton, which was the urban fringe in 1936, still the urban fringe today, across to the National Park. So the combination of planning controls, of urban development and of rural conservation seem to have come to fruition here. Um, to make for what is one of the most beautiful open spaces near to one of the world's major cities.